Well, good morning. Beautiful day, isn't it? Um, let's take care of a few things. Teens, are you awake? Uh, yeah. It's okay, I'm not either. Um, did you guys have a good time at the rise? You know how I know you're not awake? I know you're not awake because we do the countdown timer before church. And the only way that I know church is about to start is because I listened for you to start counting down. Amen. And you were silent this morning. <laughs> you were napping. Well, um, there are certain moments of life that are launch points for us. Certain moments that are key critical transition moments, moments when you are launched to do something on your own. You remember the first time you stepped onto the school bus by yourself and mom was standing outside watching? Your mom does. Um, <laughs> you remember the first time you walked up to a piano for a recital and your teacher wasn't with you? No, I don't remember that either. Um, there are certain jobs, maybe all jobs, that I wonder about. Like, what's it like for a surgeon the first time he or she is in the operating room and they are the ones totally in charge? One that we can probably have several of us relate to. What is it like the first time a pilot flies without an instructor? There is a uh, version of that that is more terrifying than any of those. It is the time, the first time, that your wife sticks a piece of paper in your hand and says, I need you to go to the grocery store for me. <laughs> and you get in the car, you drive to the grocery store, you get there and you open up the piece of paper and the first thing on the list is dishwashing liquid. And you find the dishwashing aisle and discover that there is a dishwashing aisle. <laughs> there are eight sections. Each section has about 18 rows. And they are filled with dishwashing soap. Now, if you're naive, what you do is you grab one and say it doesn't matter. <laughs> and then you get home and you, heard some, you hear something like, oh, Palm olive, green apple scent? I guess I can make that work. <laughs> and we'll pretend that I didn't hear that yesterday. Um, <laughs> if you're not that naive, uh, you might just go home and give up. Or you call your wife. And you ask the question, what do you want? And she says to you, I want Dawn for hand washing dishes, not for the machine. I want the 12 ounce size, get the purple one, not the green or the orange. And you breathe a sigh of relief thinking that you've dodged a bullet. And then you look at the rest of the list. And it says yogurt, mustard, paper towels, and ice cream. The Christian life can seem a lot like God sending us to the grocery store on our own. We want to make the right choices, but we are overwhelmed. We face countless options. What school to attend? What job to take? How do we spend our money? How do we use our time? How do we relate to that difficult person in our lives? And we want to do what's right, but we feel like we are standing alone in the grocery store. And someone has ex expectations of us, and we just wish we knew what they were. We want Jesus to tell us what is the right choice. Now, as hard as that is for us, can you imagine what it must have been like for the disciples in John chapter 13? They have followed him every day for three years. And now Jesus is telling them where he is going, they can't follow. 
Today's passage is about one of those moments where you get the news that you are going to be launched. And what Jesus does in this passage is that he prepares them. And he prepares us for how to follow him. For how to follow him when it feels like we are alone. For how to follow him when it feels like the choices are overwhelming. But here's what's interesting. What Jesus doesn't do is he doesn't give them a detailed list. What he does is he gives them principles that they are to apply. Now, we're in week three of our series on the upper room. This is Jesus' final teaching time with the disciples before he goes to the cross. And he uses his time to give parting, critical instructions to them. And it's fascinating that these instructions tend to focus on how the disciples are to treat one another. And that's actually our big theme for the year. That's our big topic. As we want to wrestle with the question, how do we as a church treat one another. And what we see in this morning's passage actually is our key verse for 2019, 1335. The way that people will know that we are disciples. The way that people will know that we are followers of Christ is not by the t-shirts that we wear. It's not by the the number of service projects we do. It's not by the hours that we spend at church. It's not by how much money we give. It is by our love for one another. The principles for relating to one another from today's passage are found in what Jesus seeks, what he sets, and what he sees. We start in the first two verses with what Jesus seeks, and what he seeks is the right glory. Okay, hard question for this audience in this part of the country. Who's going to watch the Super Bowl? Okay, well, you know, it's kind of split here. Um, yeah. <laughs> Rams versus Patriots. It's kind of hard to know who the good guys are and who the bad guys are, isn't it? Um, I tend to agree, but I don't want to get controversial. Um, you see, big sporting events like the Super Bowl tend to bring up a certain word a lot. It's the word glory. Right? You hear players and coaches talking about they want the glory of winning the Super Bowl. You're going to hear sportscasters who are going to talk about what a glorious atmosphere there is around the Super Bowl. You're going to, at the end of the game, have one person that is named as MVP, and that person is going to receive the glory for being the best that there was out there. And although we won't see it on TV, we know that there's going to be at least one fan in the stands who is going to hold up that turkey leg and say, that is glorious. You see, when we talk about the Super Bowl, we kind of know what the word glory means. It's something like being worthy of praise and respect. When a player wants the glory of the Super Bowl, what he wants is the praise and respect of winning the biggest game in their sport. The game's atmosphere is glorious because it is big. It's spectacular. It overwhelms you in a good way. And the MVP is seen as glorious, and so is that turkey leg, because everyone points to it and says, that's the best. See, when we're talking about the Super Bowl, glory means being the best and all the praise and respect that comes with it. Now, when we talk about the glory of God, that's an okay place to start. But if that's where we end up, we've kind of watered down the idea of what it means to glorify God. You see, if what we think is that God has earned the right for us to say that he's great or that we are to consider him the best or he's big and spectacular or he gets credit for all the wins in our lives, that's good, but we really need to go beyond that. God's glory is the awe-inspiring revelation of who he is. 
We admire a Super Bowl hero because they are like us, but better. We stand in awe of God because of how he is unlike us. See, we think we are powerful. And then we look up at the night sky. And we realize that God spoke the universe into existence with a word. We think we're creative. And then we look at a sunset. And said that was just a momentary thought for God. We think we love. And then we see the cross. We realize that Jesus went to the cross for people who despise God and who considered God their enemy. And we are those people. See, when we get past the watered down picture we have of God, we stand in awe of him. We are starting to see his character and his nature more clearly. And that is what God's glory is. It is the revelation of God's character, of his nature, in a way that produces awe. So in these two verses, when you see Jesus talking about glory, that's what he's talking about. That's what Jesus is seeking in these verses. The Son of Man is just a way that Jesus has of talking about himself. And what Jesus wants is he wants his own character revealed in a way that produces awe. Not because he's arrogant, because that is the way that God's character is revealed. That God is glorified. That when people see Jesus, Jesus reveals the Father to them. And it makes you stand in awe of the Father. But what's fascinating is that it goes the other way too. The Father will reveal Jesus And as we see Jesus more and more for who he is, we stand in awe of him. You see, when you see Jesus for who he is, the natural, the appropriate response, the automatic response is, we are astounded. And that is just as true for the Father. Now, it's interesting. Do you notice what happens To make Jesus enter into this conversation about glory. Judas has just left the building. Judas leaves. What does that mean? That means all the mechanisms of Jesus' betrayal, of his arrest, of his trial of his crucifixion, have all been set in motion. In other words, what is going to reveal Jesus' character, his glory, what is going to make us stand in awe of Jesus, is the cross. On the cross, you see Jesus for who he is. You see Jesus having the power to overcome the power and grip of Satan and sin in our lives. On the cross, you see Jesus accept the full destructive force of the wrath of God, a wrath that we have earned. But with all that wrath coming down on him, Jesus stays on the cross because of a love that we cannot fathom. The cross reveals humility. It reveals forgiveness. It reveals mercy. It reveals righteousness and justice and compassion all coming together. And it reveals a love that is like nothing that we have ever seen before and that we have ever seen since. It is a radical self-giving love. See, my problem in life is that I seek the wrong glory. I'm too in awe of myself. And you know what? I want you to be in awe of me as well. I want you to affirm that I'm spectacular. I want you to see what is wonderful about me. But here's the problem. There are two things that I have to do if I'm going to get that result from you. I have to hide who I really am. And I have to build myself up at the expense of someone else. 
But that's not how we see God's glory. That's not how we become to be in awe of God. To see the glory of God is to see all that is attractive and beautiful about him. It is to look at the beauty of nature and remember that everything was made by Jesus and for Jesus. It is to see him turn horrible circumstances into tools that grow us into Christ's likeness. It is to see the glory of God that is evident in him pursuing a relationship with us when we were his enemies, when no one else in their right mind would have pursued a relationship with us. And he did it through extraordinary sacrifice. The more we learn about God, the less he is hidden from us, the more we are in awe of him. I want you to stop for a second. And on your notes, I want you to write something down. It doesn't matter where. There's not a wrong place or a right place. I want you to write down one thing about God that makes you stand in awe of him. One thing about God, you say, I don't understand it, but it is just astounding. I want to be more in awe of God every day. And so I need to slow down. I need to pay attention. I need to ask what I'm learning about God's character through his creation. I need to ask what I'm learning about God's character through the events of my life, through his word, and through his people. See, the more I see God's character, the less I'm impressed with my own. But the more I will be drawn to him. The more I seek the glory of God, the better I will love God. The more I seek the glory of God, the better I will love others because I'm not going to be so worried about others being in awe of me. And it's interesting because that's where Jesus goes in verses 34 and 35. In 31 and 32, Jesus sets out that what he seeks is God's glory. And in 34 and 35, what he sets is the right standard. And it's the standard for how we're to love one another. And as we live by that standard, we see that the world is impacted. Um, sometimes it's dangerous if your boss is also enough of a friend of yours that he's kind of involved in your personal life. I had one of those once. Actually, I had one of those when Ann and I were first getting to know each other. And so my boss decided that he was going to keep score of our relationship. Uh, and here's how it worked. We started off on his scorecard as friends. And then one day after a meeting where I had said something about Ann in the course of the meeting, he flags me afterwards and says, by the way, I just changed your status from friends to friend friends. <laughs> and he was the one who told me one day, um, what did you guys just kind of call it for what it is? You've graduated to dating. Um, so he just kind of kept a, kept a scorecard. And um, I don't remember if I got a raise when he announced that we were dating or not. But I'm kind of hoping that I did. But here's the thing. We think of love in a very similar way, right? We start off as strangers. Then we go to acquaintances. Then we like each other. You know, we're friends. Then we're good friends. You know, we're friend friends. And eventually... After we've been around someone long enough and we've gotten to know them and how well they fit with us, we love them, right? And so we kind of think of love as the top of the mountain. It's the peak. Only certain relationships with certain people that are really like us, that we really like, make it to the top. Love is something that you work towards for a selected few. Do you catch that Jesus' picture of love is very different? The commandment to love one another was actually not new to them. It's all over the Old Testament in different forms. But the commandment to love one another is new because of what Jesus adds. They are to love one another the way that he loved them. 
The love that the disciples are to have for one another is supposed to look just like Jesus' love for them. You see, if we want people to know who Jesus is and what it means to be in relationship with him, this is the love that we are to have for one another. And that applies to all of us in this room. That is why verse 35 is our theme verse for this year. If we want all of Longview to know, if we want all of Longview to know who Christ is and what it means to follow Christ, if we want all of Longview to know the wonder of being in relationship with God, the way we get there is not through passing out tracts. The way we get there is to love one another as Jesus loved us. When we describe Jesus' glory as seen on the cross, what we were really describing is what his love looks like in action. It is gracious. It's compassionate. It's merciful. It's faithful. It did not wait for us to be likable. It pursued us even when we were his enemies. It shapes us into new people who live righteously. We are to love one another with the same type of self-giving love that Jesus had for us and that he showed us on the cross. That is how all people will know that we are Jesus' disciples. And it will happen when we love people radically. What keeps me from loving people the way that Jesus loved me is I have this little thought that clicks off in my mind. And it clicks off a whole bunch. And it's a thought that goes, what about me? What about me? Someone hurts me and I don't want to forgive because something inside says, what about me? Who's going to make it just for me? I can remember a friend of mine getting this job that was like, oh, what a fantastic job. I would love to have a job like that. I was happy for him some, but there was a big part of me that was going, what about me, God? When's it my turn? When do I get what I really want? You see, what about me shows up as envy when someone next to me gets a compliment? What about me shows up in the demand for justice when I am hurt, but the demand for grace when I hurt someone else? What about me shows up when I'm happy that, some, that I get something that's good, but I get bitter when someone else gets something better. Loving people the way Jesus loved requires a what about you mindset. Jesus did not go to the cross thinking, what about me? He went to the cross thinking, what about you? He went to the cross to give you what is best for you. He went to the cross to have unity with you. What would happen in this community if we didn't get mad and leave the church because someone hurt us? What would happen if what we said was, what about you? And pursued reconciliation and pursued the good of the person who hurt us. What would happen if we stood for the person who was being gossiped about instead of participating what would happen in this community if we became known as the church that cared for one another, even when it was inconvenient? Jesus answers that question. He tells us exactly what would happen. People around us would say, this is a group of people who follow Jesus. See, I fear that most people look at most churches and draw the conclusion that the people in that church are just like everyone else. The people in that church treat people just the same way that we treat one another at school, that we treat one another at work, that we treat one another in our neighborhood, that we treat one another on Facebook. Jesus revealed that if we're going to impact people, we must love one another the way that Christ loved us. Jesus revealed his character on the cross so that we would be in awe of him and of the Father. 
And Jesus shows us how to love one another with a what about you mindset. And Jesus did all of this knowing the deepest flaws of the people that he loved. What Jesus sees is the whole person. We tend to be hard on Peter in a passage like this, right? Peter sounds like he's bragging. He sounds a little arrogant, and he probably was. Um, we tend to think that what Jesus does is put him in, the pl- in his place. But I want us to think about this from another perspective. I want us to think about this from what it would be like for Peter's perspective. Peter had sacrificed a lot to follow Jesus. He had seen a lot. He had been through a lot. And I just wonder if Peter isn't very sincerely saying that there is nothing that Jesus could ask of him that he wouldn't do. There is no challenge that he wouldn't face for Jesus. And he's very sincere. And as I wonder that, as I look at that from that perspective, I realize that Peter is a lot like you and a lot like me. See, we don't have to be arrogant to say what Peter said, right? We do this sort of thing all the time. We think there is nothing we wouldn't do to follow Jesus, and we mean it. And maybe we're arrogant, but maybe we're just naive. Maybe we just don't know the next big challenge that's around the corner. Maybe we just don't know the depth of sin and selfishness that works in our lives. You see, for Peter, the next challenge was going to be more than he could handle. Peter would face the threat of ridicule and rejection. And just like Peter, for a lot of us, that is a threat that feels like death. It feels like more than we can handle. We fear that if we are ridiculed and rejected, it will hurt us so badly that we may never recover. And just like Peter, we deny even knowing Jesus. What Peter will discover is that he didn't need to lay down his life for Jesus. What he needed was for Jesus to die for him. And that exactly is exactly what Jesus is about to do. Jesus knew all about Peter. He even knew Peter's future failing. He knew Peter better than Peter knew himself. So when I read verse 36, I actually read it as a message of hope. Peter cannot follow where Jesus is going. Peter cannot die for all the sins of humanity. Peter is not yet enough like Jesus to face ridicule and rejection. But Peter's failure is not the end of the story. Peter will follow. He will go where Jesus is going. Peter will face ridicule and rejection even in the face of the Jewish authorities that he is afraid of now. And he will boldly proclaim the good news of the gospel. And one day, Peter will, in fact, die for his faith in Jesus. See, there's not a single failure that Jesus does not know about. Jesus knew exactly what Peter would do. But he loved Peter, and he had an assignment for Peter. And there's not a single failure that is ahead of you that Jesus does not already know about. And he loves you, and he has an assignment for you. And that assignment is to follow Jesus in revealing God's glory, loving one another, and seeing one another for the broken people that we are. But people who Jesus loves and died for. As you drove up to the church, it would be very hard for you to miss that we have a field of crosses in front of the church. Those crosses are designed to remind us of a cemetery. And they are designed to remind us of a cemetery because we want to be reminded, we need to be reminded, that there are real deaths that take place with abortion. But it's not lost on me that we planted crosses not gravestones. It's a very different message. See, a cross communicates more than death. A cross 
communicates grace and redemption and love. We have women in our church for whom abortion is a part of their past. And I hope when you see those crosses, the message you get is not a message of shame on you. I hope the message that you get is there is grace and redemption and hope. And I hope those crosses remind every single one of us, every time that we see them, that our sins, our failures, have been known, and yet we are loved. You see, the cross is not just a message of death. It is a message of life. It is a message of new and radical love that is found only in Jesus. A love that knows every failure and still says, I want your good and I want to be unified with you. And in the last meal Jesus had with his disciples, he pointed to the cross and he said, this is how you live when I am gone. Reveal God's awesome character. Love one another with radical selflessness. And don't give up on one another, even in failure. We wish Jesus were visibly standing right next to us, just like he had for the disciples for years until that night in the upper room. We're overwhelmed with following Jesus in a world with so many things pulling on us. We wish he would just tell us what to do. But in a sense, that's exactly what he's done in these verses. He didn't give us a shopping list. He gave us principles. And those principles are summed up in the point. We need to replace what about me with what about you. Yesterday, Ann asked me to buy yogurt, and I didn't panic. See, I knew what to get, and I knew what to avoid. If you're buying yogurt for Ann, you don't get strawberry, you don't get banana, you don't get light. You get blueberry, you get lime, you get lemon, you get vanilla. See, I've come to know Anne. I've come to know her character and her preferences. And that's the goal with Jesus. Get to know his character and preferences well enough that we more automatically love one another with Jesus' kind of love. Then all of Longview will know that we are his disciples. So how do we take steps towards that? Suggested four. Adam mentioned the Connect card that's on the bottom of your bulletin earlier in the service. There's a place on that Connect card where you can indicate how you want to respond to this message with one of these four or something else. And if you do that and you put that in one of the boxes in the foyer after the service, our staff gets those and we pray for every one of them and would encourage you to do that. So how do we respond Again, as we say every week, use the questions to share with one another. Discuss one another the message and how God is at work in your life through it. I would encourage you to go back and study all of John 13 and just look for how does Jesus demonstrate love? Pray. The work of being in awe of God is not something you can just manufacture on your own. It is a work of the Holy Spirit. So becoming more in awe of God always, always, always starts with prayer. And then practice. Catch yourself every day. Pay attention every day. How does that what about me thought spring up in your head? How do you see that at operation in your life? And as you catch yourself, We'll work on replacing it with what about you. We need prayer after a message like this. And so I'm going to ask our prayer team to come forward. We need prayer because we are not capable of replacing awe of self with awe of God. We are not capable of replacing what about me with what about you. Without the Holy Spirit doing a miracle in our hearts, we are stuck being self-focused and self-absorbed. 
So let's take the first step and pray. And these men and women are up here to pray with you in that journey. But they'll pray with you about anything. If you are struggling in a relationship, in a job, if you just have burdens in your life that you want someone to stand next to you and go before the Lord with you, that's what these folks are here for. Would you stand with me and let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we cannot comprehend the vastness, the wonder of your character. You are so immense, so big, yet you are so intimately concerned with every detail of our lives. You sustain the universe and you sustain us. Lord, we are insignificant compared to you. But we are incredibly significant because we are created in your image and loved by you. So Lord, help us as we leave here to leave here with a greater sense of awe of who you are not just so we could stand in awe, but so that we would better understand how we can love one another with a love that is like Jesus. Lord, we need your help with that starting right now. And we ask for that in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let me leave you with this thought. You cannot, it is impossible for you to comprehend the vastness of Jesus' love for you. But here's your challenge. You can leave here with the desire to comprehend it a little bit more than you do. So my challenge is to leave here and get to know his love a little more. You're dismissed.